and benefit solutions and uh, he had to correct me this morning I saw first son and I thought that was home run but it's human resources so thank you so much for that but Elliot is a local boy as we would say and his father was just a giant in ministry as a matter of fact we may be having this prayer breakfast this morning because of the leadership that his father exerted on our community. And I first came to a prayer breakfast that his father hosted, 
and I just began to hear his talk, him talking about how much love he had for his fellow man, and it reached all the way to Africa and, and things that he was doing. And First Presbyterian has just been a major player, a catalyst in activating leadership in our community. And, and so this morning, his subject is generational leadership impacting the world for Christ. And so we are excited about that. And now to see him walking in his father's footsteps. And sometimes we are looking for someone to be at a podium or to be in the pulpit, someone sharing the word in a powerful. But you know what I love about him is a personal commitment to each human being that he meets, that he is sharing the love of Christ and lifting them up. And I want you to know that there's not a time that goes by that he's not interested in what's happening in our city. And he has been instrumental in bringing something called professional employment employee leasing to our community. And uh, he, he'll tell you more about that. But there innovative and revolutionary concepts that he's brought. And we like to think of it as uh, the second generation of some ideas that his father had been manif manifested in this generation. But I want you to know that the love of the father that comes through the son has touched us all. So this morning, won't you welcome my friend and my colleague, Brother Elliot Powell. Ellie, you know, I didn't mention Miss Sandlin, but we'll talk about that in a few. Well, I, I was uh, very pleased to come here this morning and see Brother Perry. Yeah. Where'd he go? <laughs> to get something to eat. Good for him. But my neighbor was uh, uh, taken care of for many years by Perry. And we definitely have a relationship. We've rekindled it recently. We've run into each other a few times. and. Uh, just a gentle soul and, and also obviously a very good uh, musician and, and uh, piano player. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Sir. God is good. All the time. <laughs> I've never given my testimony. I've been asked to give my testimony this morning, so it's kind of an interesting thing that I had to take some time and actually write down my remarks so that I would First of all, keep it to a limited amount of time. Perry, <laughs> how are you, brother? Doing, doing Good to see you again. Just recently saw each other, and I'm very uh, surprised and pleased to see you here this morning. I had no idea that that was another one of your many talents. <laughs> and thank you, uh, Bishop Reb Fern. Yes, we used to call you Red. <laughs> Uh, back in the day, uh, it's an honor to be here this morning. Um, but you've been a busy man. <laughs> Just a little bit. Uh, Mark Twain once wrote, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And many of our people are sorely in need of these on this account. Yeah. Broad, wholesome, charitable views men and things that cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. Surely no one can say that about you, sir. <laughs> Much less you being in one spot or in one little corner. Maybe every corner. <clears throat> but I've always admired you. My father, in fact, did introduce me to Red many years ago through a Bible study group called Columbia Alive. This study brought together leadership of Columbia's black community and white community, and we broke bread and studied the word in the name of Jesus, much like we're doing here this morning. That was groundbreaking. Back then, the churches had their walls around them, and they really didn't look outside those walls to build a community of Christians. Mm -hmm. This organization does that here in Columbia and worldwide. 
to thank you for all that y'all do, both of you, your ministry, and everyone here, I'm sure. I have to acknowledge Charlotte Berry, mm -hmm. uh, wonderful person. I work with you on Salvation Army Board, and frankly, what aren't you doing <laughs> to, uh, to help nonprofits, charities? Uh, you and your husband, Joe, are just very, very dear to me. Uh, I went to school with Gwen. What? We're <laughs> Vikings. <laughs> 2000, uh, 1978 in class. Which brings out the largest class, I think, in history of South Carolina. We had over 1,000 wow. seniors in that class. What? Wow. Wow. That was the year before they broke the school in half and started Richland Northeast. Mm -hmm. And it's just now getting back to where it was because we were a juggernaut back then. <laughs> It's good to see you. <laughs> uh, this Columbia Live prayer breakfast, um, every time we met, we were breaking down barriers, improving race relations, and it was really a blessing to see how that brought many of the churches in Columbia together and made us all realize that we have this common bond in Jesus. Christ. Uh, Columbia Live and the men that, um, that I learned from, and this was decades ago, um, taught me the value of Bible study. Um, but that was a powerful effort. Um, most of the founders of that group have since passed, and uh, my father went to the Lord in 2006, and I like to think of all those guys that have passed uh, still getting together for breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully they're thinking about us this morning and helping us, helping me specifically get through this. <laughs> Again, this is my first time giving my testimony, so bear with me. Uh, your theme today, a legacy of generational Christians. Uh, I can say my father contributed to strengthening my faith in Jesus Christ as much or more than anyone. And uh, in the Presbyterian Church, we call this the Covenant of Grace. Many people don't understand why we baptize infants, but it's all to keep that generational Christian faith in the family strong. It's biblical. What's interesting about my father was only a few years younger. He was only a few years younger than me, so I'm, I'm 57. He was only a few years younger than me when he came to the Lord. Uh, but um, this faith was strengthened about how salvation worked by a friend. Many of you may know Jack Matthews, who's also passed. But Jack asked him one day, frankly, after a Bible study, he said, Key, are you going to go to heaven and why? And my father looked at him strangely, like he couldn't believe the questions were being answered. He says, um, well, to make a long story short, he discovered that uh, uh, it wasn't all the many things he was doing. He was very involved in his church, uh, prided himself in going to church every Sunday. Um, but Jack, discovered, uh, Jack explained to him for the first time, strangely enough, that he could have a direct relationship with Jesus Christ. And he was on his knees crying in Jack's office when he left. He was a different man. And he took every opportunity he could from that day on to make sure everybody knew his new best friend. Anybody. Father, yeah. and my father uh, took a lot of um, self-motivation uh, and, and it helped him much when he was able to bring some of the black leadership and the white leadership of this community together and break down those barriers. It's what's in here, not the color of our skin. And so I'm very proud of the fact that father had such a uh, big part of my, my uh, strength in my faith. Um, John 3.3, 3, Jesus is explaining to Nicodemus 
that truly, truly, I say, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. My father and generally most Christians have that moment. And they can look back and surrender their Lord the, to the day where they surrendered their Lord to Christ, their, their life to Christ, and their lives were suddenly changed forever. Now my story uh, is a little different. Um, further down in John 3, 6, it says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. My testimony is one where I can tell you that I was born on December 23rd, 1959, two days before Christmas, at the Providence Hospital here in Columbia. And um, <laughs> it was shortly after that that they stopped delivering babies over there, so I'm not sure how to take, not to take that personally. <laughs> But continue on, Dal. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, in that situation, it was not unusual to let mothers go home and have Christmas if they had small children. So they left me in the hospital for Christmas, my first Christmas, with the nuns. <laughs> and I was told they made a real fuss over me. And I guess they felt a little sorry that I was there, so they, they made sure I was I was taken well care of. And I, I, uh, I just think that's one of them. Uh, maybe because the whole world and I celebrated um, both of our birthdays at the same time. I don't know. <laughs> but I have always felt a connection and have had a relationship with him. I can't remember a time when I didn't have him to talk to. I don't, didn't always listen, but he was loudest when I was bad. Continuing further down, John 7 and 8, John 3, 7 and 8, Jesus goes on to say, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The winds blow where they wish, and you hear the sound, but you do not know where, they come, where it comes from or where it goes. So it's with everyone, it's, it is with everyone who is born in the Spirit. So it is with everyone who is born in the Spirit. I believe I was born in the Spirit. Oh, it's an unusual thing. I don't know if I'm missing out on something, uh, not having that moment when I came to Christ that I can share with you this morning. But I am blessed that he's been with me all my life. I have a personal relationship with him. I've always believed in him. I know who he is, that he lowered himself to my level, and if I repent, he showed me mercy mm -hmm. in taking my sins unto himself. Amen. Over time, I have discovered that I was born with eyes to see and ears to hear. Mm -hmm. What a blessing. My struggle has always been truly listening and applying it to what he tells me, in fact. Uh, my terrible twos extended well beyond my college days. <laughs> <laughs> Even today. <laughs> I'm very challenged, uh, I guess as we all are, to keep it on the path. I have to reaffirm my faith every minute of every day. I have learned that I must surround myself daily with other Christians through church, prayer groups, and Bible studies. This is a blessing that we're here today in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Reaffirming, sharpening steel. Recently, I was elected to serve uh, on the diaconate at First Presbyterian Church. This year, I'm honored to serve as the chair of the diaconate. All right. um, this is all Christ's doing. Being raised in a wonderful, with a wonderful mother and father, married to a wife for 27 years, and I will add the best mother-in-law on the planet. <laughs> How many people can say that? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe only you. Raising three sons, 
Everything I've accomplished, everything that I have, my success in owning a business for over 30 years, all came from him. If I think for a second mm. that I had something to do with it, mm. all of a sudden my sales start going down. <laughs> mm. you know, so it humbles me, keeps me close. My sanctification walk, uh, where am I today with that? Well, again, I have to struggle with my sin. My father once shared a helpful reminder as a challenge. Faith, it's the word faith, the acronym. Yeah. Yeah. Many of you know that that's a motto that we can live by. Forsaking all, mm -hmm. I take him. Mm -hmm. F-A-I-T-H. Forsaking all, I take him. Yeah. Can I ever accomplish this? No. Mm -hmm. But I'm getting better because of his grace and mercy yeah. and staying in the word. I have to remind myself with the help of others, that we are created to glorify Him. It's not all about it's not all about being happy in this fallen world. That, my friends, is fake news. Mm -hmm. Because I believe that the solution to every problem is found in the gospel, in His Word. Yes. I most often find myself ineffective when I'm trying to share the, His truth to non-believers. That scripture truth that just isn't always there when I need it. I have a wonderful summer lecture series at First Presbyterian Church uh, just during the Sunday school hour. And someone who was, gave a lecture a few weeks ago said something that stuck with me. He said, people who do not hear the music think the dancers People yeah. who do not hear the music think the dancer's mad. Mm. Can't you just imagine? We are all here dancing <laughs> to the beautiful song of his gospel. But those who haven't been given ears to hear the music see us and think, we have lost our minds. Right, 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 right. <laughs> we don't deal with that, don't we? <laughs> well, I must be patient. Share what God has meant to me in my life. Then take a step back and give the Holy Spirit room to work. Isaiah 6, 8 through 11, speaks to the challenge of trying to share the gospel. And I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Mm. And I said, here, here I am, Lord, yeah. send me. Mm -hmm. And he said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but not understanding. Keep on seeing, but not perceiving. Make the hearts of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and their bl eyes blind. Least they see their eyes, they see with their eyes, and they hear with their ears, and they understand with their hearts, and they turn to be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant, and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste. In other words, we've got to keep trying. I'm reminded of something else I just heard the other day, prosperity, the prosperity of righteousness consumes uh, corruption. Say that again. The prosperity of righteousness consumes corruption. So we each need to try to live a righteous lives, read life, live, live righteous lives, relying on the confidence of his promises, especially when the world comes crashing down on us. In those times when we've lost a love, right, in those right. times when everyone should see a tear and a sense of devastation. I think right. of friends who have lost children, right, right. 
first comes to mind. Yeah. How do we get through that without faith in Jesus mm-hmm. Christ? I don't know how to do it. Right. So when the darkness hits us, Jesus wants us to display the free gift of peace which passes all understanding for all to see. Be the light in the darkness. And those around us will want what we have. Then let the Holy Spirit take it from there. That's the thing that we really need to remember. We want to see that conversion. We want to take credit for that conversion. There's never been a conversion to the Lord by anyone else than the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit has to reside in your heart. So we ask the Holy Spirit enter those we pray for who do not know Christ. Now, I will say this. um, I'm a work in progress. My story's not over. And I'll close with this remark. It's uh, one that I also heard not too long ago, and it just really struck me. Our lives may be the only Bible some people will ever read. Right. Our lives, the way we live, may be the only Bible some people will ever read. So our actions, the way we live our lives, we can talk the talk, but we've got to walk the walk. Those who are most skeptical about our faith will see that in us. And not hear our words, but they see our actions. So I'll, I'll let you let you know that I think this is a very special year. Uh, 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Mm. May we all pray that the over 2 billion Christians Mm. in the world will join in prayer for worldwide revival. By the grace of our Father, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for City Lights. Thank you for this wonderful family, the Vermonts, who I know so well. Mm-hmm. Beautiful Redford, and all the many people who support this ministry. Be with their family as they travel to the ends of the earth, yeah. spreading your great commission. We know, Lord, when all have heard, will come again. We look forward to that day, Lord. We know the glory on the other side is going to be far superior than any gladness, any happiness, any wonderful experience that we've had on this earth. I personally look forward to just a big hug from all those who have passed before me who are there waiting for me. A big hug from you, Jesus, my brother. My elder brother, may all present here this morning be strengthened in their faith. May we be beacons for all to see. May they wonder where this comes from and want it for themselves. Give us the words at that particular time to share what the Lord has been in our lives so that we might give them that same opportunity. Mm-hmm. Lord, we do love you. We love yes. us. We love your son, Jesus, and why he came here to shed his blood for us so that we might have hope. And we do. We do, Lord. We count on the promises that you've made to us that give us that confidence of knowing no matter what comes our way, we have the victory. Again, Lord, thank you for this day. Bless us all. Bless this city. Bless this this state. Bless the leadership as we've done this morning already. And especially, Lord, bring us together as your people. Give us a common voice. Break down the barriers that separate us. And at this time when the world and this nation seem so divided, so much of a threat, 
this revival that I'm praying for, I hope will spread to every single person upon the planet. Hallelujah. We pray these things in your precious name, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So much. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, I want to give you a short report before we uh, close this meeting out. Ramon Balaguer, Reverend Ramon Balaguer and I went to Lebanon, Tennessee and met with Dr. Stephen Manley. As a lot of you are aware, we have something called the Ecumenical University. And in that university is the Cross Style College. And Dr. Manley is our bishop in that area and our chief uh, academic officer. Dr. Manley and uh, his committee and team met yesterday with Reverend Ramon and I and we are talking about building a college in Lebanon, Tennessee. We went up and looked at a piece of land that has uh, about six acres and just about everything that we need, a wonderful building, 29 classrooms, a huge sanctuary, and had a, a, what they call an LMS, a learning management system, already installed on their computer system. And it's about $4.9 million. But we've already set up the team to start the process of acquiring that property and building the Cross Style College there. The members on the team uh, acknowledge that Dr. Manley has been an itinerant evangelist for 50 weeks out of every year. He would be in a different church for the last 50 years. And he has come off the road and established a church and the college, and we have students there now. We have about 25 students who are attending there now. We also have a drug and alcohol program there uh, for men and women who've had difficulties with their life. We have about 15 houses that we're housing them in. We bought the whole block. But Dr. Manley sends, sends his regards and was incredibly encouraged by the things that you have facilitated in Africa. Our campuses in Africa, in Maga Maga, Uganda, we've completed the multi-purpose building, the Welcome Center, the architect has delivered us plans for both women and men's dormitory, as well as the cafeteria and the kitchen. And so those things are going forth. On our second campus in Masindi Port, We've completed the first building and in the process of painting it. And the third campus, the land has already been donated. So that's three starts in uh, East Africa. I want you to know that here in Columbia, South Carolina, we've just had our first committee meeting and we have our eye on a piece of property here that's $3.5 million, it's 17 acres, and we would like to build our campus for the Ecumenical University on this piece of property. And in the university now, we have the Cross Style College. The second addition is coming from the NDI with Mr. Jimmy LaRose. His 25 years of nonprofit management and philanthropic studies, we're bringing that into the college as an online series of courses. We also have met with the world-renowned famous horse whisperer. Uh, and if you don't know this man, get to find out, find out about him. His name is Monty Roberts. And he has pioneered the, the introduction of a nonviolent system of gentling horses. You probably heard the expression, breaking horses. He said, no, we don't want to break the horse. We want to gentle the horse so that the horse and a human being can relate and you can put a saddle on the horse and ride. Normally what they do, they tie the horse legs to a pole, they beat him with a two by four, they beat and break that horse into submission. And they usually take six weeks to a couple of months to do this, but Mr. Roberts is able to do this in a week without any violence. And we're working with this system in the prisons with uh, men and women who are uh, charged with criminal domestic violence. And this whole notion of violence in our community is something that we will be exploring in the college. Now, just to take a moment to share with you how he does it. The horse has his own space and his own territory, and Mr. Roberts respects that. 
The horse is real sensitive because it is not a predator. You notice that the eyes are on the side of the head. Predator's eyes are in front. And so when we approach a horse, it's a predator approaching prey. And so he turns his body to the side and he approaches the horse, but he doesn't get in the horse space and he backs away. He takes a deep breath and releases it and he lowers his heart rate. And the horse can sense that the heart rate has changed, the breath is going. When we get ready to attack, what do we do? We inhale, take on a lot of oxygen for fuel, the heart rate goes up to pump adrenaline and blood through our stream, and we're in attack mode. But he's signaling to the horse, I'm not in attack mode. And so the horse comes a little closer, and they go through this dance of getting to know one another. One of the predators for horses is the mountain lion. The mountain lion has huge feet. And when it spreads out its feet and those claws come out, well, it looks a lot like a hand. And so if you were to approach a horse like this, he's thinking survival and mountain lion, and he could hurt you. But it's just knowing the horse. And so we're taking these ideas and bringing them to our interpersonal communication and relationship. And so while we're going to have the Monty Roberts University for equine training, we're also going to be taking these principles of nonviolence and using them throughout the areas of social work, in prison ministry, and a number of other things. Amen. But uh, I've met with Monty Roberts and his daughter. They were in uh, Vienna. And somebody please tell me of those famous horses in Vienna. What, what, what are their names? Lippenstein. He's there. They've been training horses for over 300 years. Mm -hmm. And in the same arena, they have called him to talk about new ways of training their horses without being violent. I know these horses from General Patton at the movie. But it's amazing what he has accomplished. Uh, the Queen of England has horses in her stable, and her men, uh, horsemen, have to break them and train them. And she asked Monty Roberts to come over and visit with her and look at her horse operation. And he was over there for a week. She had 30 horses that they couldn't break. In five days, he gentle and prepared for riding with saddle and a rider. In five days, he did 20 horses. And so she, he has been knighted by the queen and appointed her personal horse person. And so we're going to be adding that to the university. We have some great news for those who are interested in taking Greek. We have a gentleman who's preparing a course for 24 hours of Greek training in two sections, 12 hours each. So our students will be getting that. Uh, some of you were here at the graduation the commencement services, the baccalaureate services, and our annual convocation. And we had eight uh, graduates, the first eight graduates in the U.S. to graduate. If, if some of them are here now, won't you stand? Amen. Now, they received an associate degree, our first associate degrees given in the U.S. Give them a hand. Now they have gone, they're going on in uh, January, uh, June of next year, they'll be awarded, if they complete the material, a baccalaureate degree. And uh, we're just so excited about that. The work in Africa is going on. Uh, we have over 1,500 uh, people to have graduated in East Africa. Uh, we talked with uh, Agre Johnson, and we are building another church in Africa. There will be 15 churches in one building. And uh, we have accomplished this, the first part of that deal, yesterday. And we'll be traveling to East Africa in December. And we pray that your prayers will be with us and for the work more than they are for us. We are expendable, but the work goes on. Elliot, uh, you may have asked yourself, well, why me? Uh, you, in first prayers, there's so many great speakers. Why me? I wanted you to know that not only are you a good friend, but a, a, a person that one can count on, that you've demonstrated leadership, 
But I want you to know that you have a legacy that just has impacted all of the work we're doing. I um, had said at some point, back to Africa? I didn't leave anything in Africa. Why should I go back to Africa? But it was your father that introduced me to mission work in Africa. And the very first contribution that I gave, independent of all the uh, other general funds that we have, was to your father and Chippy in Kenya. And uh, I never knew that that one dom uh, donation, that one act of him witnessing to me would lead to the work that we are now doing. And I want you to, every time you hear City Light, know that your dad had impact and his legacy is left. Uh, we are also, uh, at the beginning of next year, to fund some of these things, we'll be looking to families throughout the world, at the country in particular, to begin to think about how they can leave a gift to help us with the construction of these things. Buildings do not make ministry. Buildings do not make ministry. Relationships, personal relationships make ministry. Buildings and teachers do not make education. It's relationship. Jesus was an extraordinary teacher, not by just the content of what he taught, but the way in which he taught. Amen. So the one thing we want you to know that these institutions that we've created have the basis and the heart of Jesus at the center, and it's relationship. We're not there to condemn you for all the work you couldn't do, all the things you failed to do, but we're to encourage you to grow stronger in the things that you are doing. And that there is a point to all of this that we do, and it is to have Jesus impact the world and make a difference. We want you to know that we are in Africa and Asia because there is conflict there. And we believe that our gospel, the gospel that we preach, is the only answer to conflict. When uh, the Boko Haram, when ISIS is cutting off the head of a Christian, we stand as the new martyrs and say that we will lift the other head or turn the other cheek. It is not a war that we seek. It's not retribution that we seek. It is the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. So everything that we're doing, every prayer that we pray, is not just for those who are saved and comfortable in the faith, not for those who are just locked down in church. It is for even those who smite us, behead us, hurt us, harm us. We are praying for them that they would come to the full knowledge of Jesus Christ. And there are many people in the world who have made God more of a valet. So, oh God, I need this. Heal me. Fix me. You know that death is the permanent healing. Amen. But we are saying that, God, we want relationship with you. We want you to leave heaven and indwell us. Fill us with your very essence and being. And because of you, there is no manner of atrocity that we cannot endure. There's no manner of forgiveness that's too great for us. And so, and I, I never worry about the numbers because Jesus had only 12 and impacted the world. He said, well, Red, he did feed 5,000, but they didn't join the church. He did feed 4,000. He healed lepers, but they did not become a part of the little crew that he had. And so I'm encouraged, Janice, that you're still a part of this little crew, Charlotte. I, I'm encouraged that you're still here. And there are greater things that we will do because of him. And I sometimes become discouraged. I look out and say, oh, where is everybody else? And I, I have to focus. It's not on how many, it's not on how much, but it's how well I can acquit myself for the task. And I want you to know that everyone here, you've done a great job, and there's more to be done. Let us stand. We're going to ask the Reverend Ed King to come and give us our benediction and final blessings and any remarks that he may have. Reverend King. say that I'm not very good at benedictions. Mm. 
I like to begin things. I don't like to end them. Yeah, okay. We can go on for another hour. I'll be fine, right? We're gonna, <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. We might have things to do. Let's bow our heads. I do, and Father, we do thank you for this hour. We thank you for this opportunity to come together and to be to lift up your name and to lift up ourselves too, and lift up ourselves as we walk now into the new world before us. Mm -hmm. Be with us and God and direct us in all that we do and we know that you are with us always. Where the two are gathered together, there you are also. Bless us now and keep us and go with us our walk wherever we go. For we pray these things in Jesus' name Jesus. and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Amen.